everybody, and welcome to Live with Lon this week. We're so glad that you're with us. And uh, uh, we want to begin uh, by praying, of course, for what's going on over in the Middle East. And so let's do that right now. Dear Lord Jesus, we know that you are the sovereign God of our universe. And as such, you have plans for everything that happens that are far beyond anything that we could ever figure out in our human minds ahead of time. And so, Lord Jesus, we commit the situation over in Israel and Gaza to you because we know you have a purpose for this. And that gives us great comfort. But, Lord, our prayer would be that you would bring an end to the hostilities that you would keep things over there from exploding and getting any bigger. Lord, that you would pour calm on the water like you did on the Sea of Galilee. And you would simply say to this conflict, hush, stop it. And Lord, that there would be a restoration of calm uh, there in Israel and Gaza and the Middle East. Lord, we pray for the hostages, uh, that it would be worked out for them to be able to be returned safely and quickly. And Lord, we ask you to uh, uh, just descend on that whole situation. We pray for the people who have lost loved ones or who have had loved ones wounded, both in Gaza and in Israel. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to give them comfort and to succor their souls. And Lord, somehow, some way, to use all of what's happening there for the glory of Christ and to bring people to yourself, both in Gaza and in Israel. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, what? Come on. Amen. And what? Amen. Yes. Well, I know you're praying for the Middle East, and so I want to announce to you that on our website, we have, I believe it's seven messages from my Roma series on the book of Romans years ago, Romans 9, 10, and 11, which is all about the past, present, and future of Israel, and why Israel is in unbelief and has been for 2,000 years when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And uh, uh, these are uh, older messages. They're 55 minutes long, most of them. This is in the old days when we only had a, a service, uh, and McLean was so small, and I could preach as, uh, 55 minutes. <laughs> that was, those were great days. I could include so much more mass and so much more spiritual meat. So, anyway, I think you'll really enjoy those messages. In fact, I know you will. And if you're looking to get some perspective, uh, some context, uh, if you will, for uh, the Middle East, the future of Israel, what's going on over there, why, don't the, why didn't the Jews accept Christ, why don't they at this present time as a as a people, accept him, all of that, uh, you need to listen to these messages. They're also on uh, um, uh, Instagram, and they're on Facebook, and, uh, and I believe they're on our app. So we just put them up. They're there now, and, and I re recommend them highly to you uh, 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 to help you uh, get some, as I say, some context for all that's going on. Uh, on our website, Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, 11, and I think they're entitled, What About Israel? Okay. Now, just before we dig in today, uh, I have a shout out. Uh, this past week, I spoke to uh, a family uh, who is in the army, uh, the, uh, the, the husband is in the army and uh, is stationed in Tel Aviv, the U.S. Army. And he was here with the family for on vacation. 
And uh, when hostilities broke out and they were just getting ready to head back over there to Tel Aviv, and I had a chance to talk to them on the phone and pray with them. And uh, uh, they told me uh, that they listened to Live with Lon uh, every week and that their children, their two children, uh, not just listen to Live with Lon, uh, but they listened to my recorded sermons uh, from the time I was at McLean Bible Church, and they listened to him almost every day. They listened to a message. Uh, and how sweet is that? So I had a chance to talk to them. Their names are Ruth and Daniel. So I promised that I would give a big shout out to Ruth. God bless you, dear. And to Daniel. God bless you, buddy. And uh, recognize them and thank them so much for being such faithful listeners and prayer warriors for our ministry, uh, as well as their mom and dad. And so we pray for your family right now. Lord Jesus, protect this sweet family and help uh, both Ruth and Daniel grow up to be a man of God and a woman of God who make an impact on their world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, they told me how old they were. I think Ruth is like uh, 12-ish, 11 or 12-ish, and Daniel's like 9 or 10-ish. How great is it to have children that age listening and understanding uh, what we teach, how we teach it, so they can even understand it at the age of 8 and 9 years old. You know, that's what I learned when I went to seminary. Them, The gentleman who taught me how to preach, uh, Dr. Tom Edgar, who's with the Lord now, but a wonderful man of God. Now, he used to always say, uh, uh, organize your, your sermons uh, so, that they, uh, uh, so that a junior high schooler can understand them. And if a junior high schooler can understand them, adults will think you're wonderful because they can understand them too. And that's what I've always tried to do, and it, it is so uh, rewarding uh, to hear young people uh, like Daniel's age, uh, like Ruth's age, saying, hey, we listen, and we understand it. We get it. Praise the Lord. All right. So that's my shout out, and I promised I would say, Ruth, Daniel, how sweet it is <laughs> to have you listening God bless you. Now, to the passage. We're in <clears throat> Matthew chapter 21, New King James Version of the Bible. And in Matthew chapter 21, uh, we've been looking at the parable of the wicked vine dressers. And you know the parable of uh, the landowner who is God sent many, many servants who are the prophets to these wicked vine dressers that he had left in charge of his vineyard, the Jewish leaders, and they paid no attention to these messengers. So finally he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they decided to kill him. And as a result, the Bible says he's going to take away the vineyard from them, and, and he's going to give it, look what he says here, and he said he is going to give it to a nation bearing the fruits of, thereof. So, we've talked about this for two or three weeks now, uh, because uh, then he quotes the Old Testament, Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful in our eyes. And we said that uh, what he means by that is that the builders looked at the stone, like the stonemasons who did part of the front of my house, and they threw it away and rejected it. And God, by his supernatural action, took that very stone, the Lord Jesus Christ, and brought it back and made it the head cornerstone around which the whole building takes form and shape and direction and meaning. Okay, so we've discussed that. Uh, because that verse is quoted a number of times in the New Testament. And you should go back and get the last two or three messages because it's all about uh, this messianic verse. And, uh, but there's one more place that it's quoted that we've not looked at yet, 
which has a very different so what to attach to it uh, than the verses that we have, the uh, places we have looked already. And so that's in 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims scattered throughout, and by he calls them pilgrims uh, because uh, he will go on to say that the, we are, this is not our home. We're just passing through as pilgrims and strangers in this world. This world's not our home. We're on our way to heaven. That's why he calls them pilgrims. So the pilgrims through, uh, throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, that's who he's writing to. Now these five words, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, these are all Roman provinces in the modern-day country of Turkey. Uh, they, Asia's on the far west of modern-day Turkey, the far west. Uh, Bithynia's on the north, up by the Black Sea, and but they're all provinces within Turkey. So these are Gentiles. This is not written to Jewish people, for the, you know, for the most part. It's written to Gentiles throughout Asia Minor. Okay, now that's important. Uh, it'll come into play in terms of what we're going to be going to read. All right, verse chapter two, verse one. Therefore, laying aside malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking, boy, that would be a wonderful text to preach. Now, to Christians, who these are secret sins, but these secret sins control the life and ruin the life of so many Christians and the people around them. But that's not, it's not the message for today. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, the, by the scripture, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, you're a believer. Coming to him, look at verse 4, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. What is he referring to here in verse 4? He's referring to the verse from Psalm 118 <clears throat> that we just talked about. Chosen by God to be the chief cornerstone, rejected by men, the Lord Jesus Christ. Coming to him, the Lord Jesus Christ, you also, as living stones. That's part of our title today. Doing good as living stones. This is the imagery Peter is using, uh, that we are not the cornerstone, we are the rest of the stones that are being, look at this, built up to a, uh, up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are those living stones that are being built in this image into the kingdom of God with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. You get this. And we're going to offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. We don't sacrifice chickens and goats, physical sacrifices. We give them the sacrifice of obedience and the sacrifice of thanksgiving and the sacrifice of praising him. And, and so these are spiritual sacrifices. Now, therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Now, this is, this is Isaiah 28 that we looked at a week ago. It ties in with Psalm 118, therefore, verse 7, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, Psalm 118, and a stone 
of stumbling and a rock of offense from Isaiah chapter 8, which we also looked at a week ago. So we said that the people who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah trip over him because of, we said it last week, their ignorance, their unawareness of the gospel, their stubbornness, and their arrogance. Pick up, listen to the message last week. They trip over the stone, and they end up missing eternal life and missing heaven. Watch, they stumble being, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Other translations will say, and to this doom they were appointed, or, ju or just as it was planned, some translations will say. This, uh, would, this tends to make you think, doesn't it? Last week we talked about there is a remnant among the Jewish people chosen by grace. Here we talk about people stumbling over the stone as their doom uh, was appointed by God for them. It makes, it makes election like five-point Calvinism sound like it might be right, huh? I don't know. I'm not a five-point Calvinist. I'm not a Arminian. I'm a just believe the Bible and admit I can't understand it. Okay, now, but you are a chosen generation you as believers, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, verse 10, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who were once, who once had not attain, obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Remember, who is he writing to? Jews? No. Gentiles. And Gentiles, look at verse 10 again. They were once not a people, but now they're the people of God. They weren't the people of God before they came to the gospel and came to Christ, but now they are. Who once had not obtained mercy, but now they have because they believe the gospel. Okay, you with me? All right, he says that because he's writing to Gentiles. Now, finally, therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. You say, the reason I do good is so that I don't get punished. That's a good reason. The reason that I obey the law is so that I don't get caught and put in jail. Good reason. The reason I do what's right is because I want everybody around to think that I'm an honorable person. Okay. But this is not what the passage says. It says, therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Why do I do good? All these other reasons are fine, but I do good first and foremost for the Lord's sake, that he not be embarrassed, that he not be criticized, that he might not be ashamed, that he might not be mocked and made fun of and dishonored because of my doing wrong things. You with me? That's for the Lord's sake. Paul echoes this in Colossians 3, verse 23. It says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not as unto men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive your reward. You do, we do things as unto the Lord. We don't do them as unto men. And unto men, sure, it's great if they respect us, if they... Uh, honor us. That's fine. But that's not why we do it. We do it unto the Lord as Christians. And then finally, the last verse, verse 15, chapter 2, for so is the will of God, 
Wonder what the will of God is? Okay, here it comes. You say, are you going to tell me where to move? No. You going to tell me what job to take? No. But I am going to tell you the will of God. Look, for so is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free in Christ, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, for wrong, but as servants of God. Wow. 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 Not using our liberty in Christ as cloaks for doing evil and wrong, but using it as servants of God, as unto the Lord. Wow. Our passage was quoted in here, telling us that we are living stones who did not trip and stumble over the chief cornerstone. Instead, we believed in him. Verse 7, look, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. Now, that's as far as we're going to go in the passage, because we want to ask our most important question. So, are you ready? Come on now. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on. So, what? Oh, yeah. And, of course, I have my picture of Jackie. Of course. And what, what would Jackie say right here? He'd go, ah, oh, sweet it is. Yeah. To be teaching the Bible with you. Now, I know my messages have been long the last several weeks. Because, wow. You know, I mean, there was so much to cover. And... And, you know, in the early days when I first came to McLean Bible Church, as I said earlier, I, I preached 55 minutes. It was like a seminary class. Uh, but, uh, and I taught seminary, so I was used to that. But nobody, nobody likes 55-minute messages anymore or 45-minute messages. So I'm going to make this one short. Okay? And here's the point. The point is verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free but not using your liberty as a cloak for evil, but as servants of God. And as I said earlier, verse 13, we submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. This is the point. That is, living stones... We are to do good for the Lord's sake. If you want to take something home from today, you know our one declarative sentence. As living stones, we are to do what is good and right in men's eyes for the Lord's sake. Now, we already said, what does that mean, for the Lord's sake? It means so he is not embarrassed so that he is not ridiculed by people so that people don't make fun of him so that people don't mitigate his credibility so that people don't say oh look see there <laughs> see what that christian just did uh, yeah yeah uh, christians yeah the gospel god jesus yeah right so that he is not put to shame so that he is not made fun of and mocked so that he is not diminished in the eyes of men and women. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, it's important to do right so you don't go to jail and so you don't get fined and so you don't get arrested and so that you don't get in trouble. Yeah, I mean, that's all true. But as Christians, we have a higher motive. And our motive is for the Lord to be not dishonored by our behavior. Now, let's ask this question in closing. If a Christian does what's wrong, if we do something that is uh, evil, and uh, uh, does that does that mean the gospel is not true? No. Does that really mean uh, that the gospel can be dismissed? No. The Bible is still inerrant even if I do something wrong. The messianic prophecies of the Old Testament 
are still fulfilled in Jesus if I do something wrong. The uh, uh, miracles Jesus worked when he was here on earth to affirm his messiahship, they're still real and cogent and powerful in spite of the fact I did wrong. What he did for people on the cross is still efficacious even if I did wrong. And the resurrection of the dead and the ascension into heaven is still true even if I did wrong. So even if I do wrong as a believer, it does not negate the gospel and the faith. But people will use my wrongdoing, get this now, to excuse their unbelief. My wrongdoing does not justify their unbelief. Nothing justifies their unbelief. As I just said, all these things are still true. You with me? But they will use it to excuse their unbelief. They're determined not to believe, and now this gives them an excuse. It's a red herring, uh, but they'll still use it. Oh, I knew a Christian once. How many times have I heard that? How I knew a Christian once, and they did this, and they did that, and they did the other thing, and they did this. Yeah, Christianity, Jesus, the gospel. Yeah. Well, well, hey, when, I, when I'm talking to people like that and trying to share Christ, I'm like, okay, so they did wrong. Well, that has nothing to do with nothing. It has nothing to do with the fact that you've done wrong and you're on your way to hell and that trust in Jesus is the only way to escape that. That has nothing to do with that. I'll admit Christians do wrong. Okay, that's why we all need a Savior. Now, let's get back uh, to the main point here. You with me? Uh, but people love to use that stuff. And the church, the church did the Crusades. The church did the Inquisition. There were churches who supported uh, uh, Hitler. There were churches who knew about the Holocaust and did nothing. Uh, there are churches where sexual abuse has become a real problem. Uh, uh, there's churches and churches and churches who do this with money and whatever, whatever. Yeah. Okay. But that doesn't change a thing about the cross, the resurrection, your need for Christ, because you're going to hell. But Peter is saying here, the Lord's reputation is at stake with people. His credibility is at stake with people. And that when we, as living stones, as his followers, do what's wrong, we are opening the door for people to accuse him of wrongdoing, to impugn him as the holy God of the universe, to mock him as God Almighty. Do you understand what I'm saying? Ignorant men and women. That's what verse 15 says. Put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It's ignorance because God is not, is, cannot be impugned. His credibility cannot be lowered. But people will do it on the basis of the behavior of us as living stones. So that's the message today. As living stones, God wants us to do right for the Lord's sake. Not just our sake, but for the Lord's sake. And to defend his reputation by the way we behave and act. Now, can we ever be perfect? Of course not. But we can go back and own our stuff and apologize for what we do wrong. And sometimes going back and asking for forgiveness is actually a greater witness than getting it right in the first place. But I'll tell you what's not a great witness is when we get it wrong and we're so arrogant or whatever uh, that we refuse to admit it. That's not enhancing the Lord's reputation. So be careful. This is what I want you to take home today. Lord, take me home. This is a good prayer. 
take me home to be with you in heaven right away if you know that by leaving me here I'm going to do something that is going to shame you, embarrass you, open the door for people to impugn you or the gospel. Take me home first. Don't let me do that, Lord, please. That's my prayer all the time. Please don't let me do that. Take me home. I'm ready. And Lord, take me home first, please. Uh, I can live with going home. In fact, I'd be thrilled to go to heaven. But I can't live with spending my whole life trying to serve you and honor you, and then at the end of my life doing something that disgraces you. I, Lord, please don't let that happen. Please don't let me do that. Take me home. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, for the Lord's sake, we do all things heartily as unto the Lord. For the Lord's sake, we do what's right as living stones, not using the freedom you've given us in Christ as a cloak for evil, but rather using it as servants of the living God. Lord Jesus, help us, help us, help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to remember that everything we do is for the Lord's sake. That's why we do right. We seek to do right. And Lord, keep us, I pray, from those things that would dishonor you. Lord Jesus, use your word in our life today in a mighty way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, what? Amen. And what? Amen. Okay, listen. I want to tell you, in closing, we've moved our October 2023 Best of the Holy Land Tour to new dates in 2024, March 3 to 11, and March 3 to 14 if you go on the extensions to Mount Sinai and Petra. And the new brochure is up online, and even if you weren't signed up for the October tour, you can still sign up for the March tour. The registration form and everything's right there. You can still sign up and join us in March. And we're praying this whole uh, a problem over there will be well over by then. And we'll be able to go to the Holy Land and rejoice in the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us together. So check it out. March 3, we scheduled to depart. And our February tour, which has a slightly different uh, program and itinerary, than the March tour. Check it out. They're both online. We're still hoping that's going to depart right on schedule February 15. Any questions, give me a call. Our phone number's there. God bless you. Have a great week.